Hello, welcome back to Rust 101. This is video 11 and we're going to go through some exercises uh, testing our knowledge on all the stuff we've done in recent videos, which is called Module A2 in the slides. So that's going to be um, like ownership, strings, references, things like that, uh, slices. Um, if you'd uh, prefer not to have spoilers, just move on to the next video. And I would highly recommend you try out these exercises yourself. Um, so have a watch of this after you've tried them, or if you're just along for the ride, then that's fine too. Okay, so um, the link to these uh, exercises uh, uh, will be in the show notes, but yeah, um, basically what the instructions say is just make the things compile. So uh, we'll mostly be looking at the code, but yeah, here's the instructions for the first exercise. Fix the two examples um, in the in the zero borrowing section and just reminding us how to run them. So let's have a look. So here we've got all the exercises um, lined up in our editor, uh, and there's basically problems with each of the programs. Um, so we can just run the compiler and see what happens. So the, the, um, the first exercise is just um, the ex uh, like the executable is called 01, or the program is called 01.rs. And we've got to make it compile, but we're only allowed to reorder things, not add, remove, or change anything. So let's um, go into the right directory. Actually, go back up and let's just do a cargo. Let's do a cargo check. Okay, so what is going on? Various compile errors. So first of all, it's saying data got moved. Borrow of moved value data. So data got moved when we called get char. Uh, and then we're trying to borrow it later in string uppercase. So that sounds not allowed. So let's have a think about how this program works. Well, first of all, hang on. Uh, okay, that's uh, that's the wrong program. Okay, let's try. Uh, now it told us how to do this, didn't it? Yeah. Right, so let's try minus minus bin zero one. There we go. Okay, and we can actually do cargo run, and it will it'll run the check. So let's do exactly what they told us to do, shall we? But first of all, let's leave some space so we can see where the errors are. Okay, so all right, much simpler. So cannot borrow x as mutable more than once. Fine. So we make a variable called x. It's mutable. It's got the number 100 in it. Um, then we take a reference to a mutable reference to x called y. Then we try and take a mutable reference to x called z. And that's already not allowed. You can't have two things that are both exclusive references to x. Then we try to change y. Uh, so it was rather to change x via y by adding 100 to it. And then we try and change you know, x via z. And then the end of the program asserts that the x did change to in both those ways um, and add up to 1200. So we want this program not only to compile, but also to successfully change x twice. So um, the problem here is that both x, but both y and z exist and are active at the same time. So what we can do is move this z part down a bit. So now we take a mutable reference to x called y, then we do something with it, and then we take a mutable reference to x called z and do something with it. And if my theory is correct, then even though y, we don't kind of drop y or anything here, it's kind of, its lifetime is kind of over on line seven because it never used again. So, and we can check that in a second. So let's try again. Look, our program runs, and also the assertion uh, succeeds, which is why we didn't get an error. Well, first of all, let's double check that the assertion is actually running. Always like to see a failing test before a passing one. Yeah, all right, so we panic now because I changed the what we were expecting. So that assertion is indeed running. So now let's test my theory that uh, Y's lifetime has kind of ended here um, by just printing out Y later. So if we just print out y, we 
should get a compile error. Because, yeah, now y exists for too long. And so you can't have z as well because you've already got a mutable borrow of x in y. So this is a nice example of why, um, of how Rust is these days, because it wasn't always like this, but these days Rust is really clever about um, what you're allowed or not allowed to do. And in this case, so long as you've finished with y, you can make a z, you can make another mutable exclusive reference to x. And the compiler just works it out. So if we delete that line, so y genuinely doesn't live any longer, or isn't needed after here, then Rust doesn't mind because there's no there's no longer two exclusive references to X that are kind of active at the same time. I'm not sure exactly what the wording is. So that was um, first exercise. Let's look at the second one. So this says you can't change anything except adding or removing references. So I guess that's adding ampersands. Okay, and we got a sneak preview, didn't we, of the error message? So let's have another look at it. So it says, um, borrow of moved value data. And now there's some hints about how to fix it. Which I don't think are the right hints in this case. And let's get to this one later. So let's first of all deal with this thing. So what it's saying is data was moved and then borrowed. So let's just look at the program and figure out. So here we where we create data. So data is a string. I can control K in my near vim to find that. So data is a string, um, which was created by taking a a, a string reference, a string reference, ampersand str, and then calling to the two string method on it. And two string returns a string. So data is a string. And then we call get char and we pass data in. So this is where it gets moved because get char takes in a string, not a reference to a string, but an actual string. And the comment here says should not take ownership, but right now it is taking ownership because it takes in a string. And then we're trying to use data later um, by saying ampersand data, uh, as in taking a reference to it. Um, but we can't do that because it's already moved. So it no longer kind of no longer exists. So what we can do is we can pass in data as a reference to get char because all it's doing is returning it just wants to look in it and find a single character and return it. It's not actually doing anything with it anyway, but anyway. So um we can say get char should we want we say we want to pass in a reference to data in to get char. Now this won't compile because get char doesn't take a reference. Uh, it takes an actual string. So let's just see that compile error happen. Um, hold on, did I not save? I didn't save. <laughs> okay. Let's try that again. So now it's saying get char expected us to pass in a string, but we passed it uh, a reference to a string. So let's change get char to take a reference to a string. By the way, as we mentioned in the um, video, ampersand string is a very rare thing to see. It would normally be ampersand str, but it says we can't change anything except adding or removing references, so we better stick to the rules. So when we run now, um, we get um, we uh, the error message that we were looking at before has gone away, and we get a new error message. Temporary value dropped while borrowed. So let's think about what's happening here. So string uppercase takes in a reference to a string and then modifies this variable data, which is a reference to a string, to point at the uppercase version of data. But um, it takes a reference to it and then immediately throws it away because this is a new string. Two uppercase returns a new string, which is a temporary value, takes a reference to it, puts that reference in data, and then throws it away. So that's not what we meant, right? Presumably what we meant was to convert this string to uppercase and then print it out. So um, what's the right answer to this? Well, I guess one thing we could do is we could take in data 
as a string instead of a reference to a string. And then not take a reference to the answer that comes back from two uppercase, which by the way is a string, a new string, not the same string, and then print it. So I think this will work. It's not how I would write this code. Yeah, look, Rust is great, it does work. It's not how I would write this code. But um, in order to change it to how I would write it, I need to do more than just add or remove ampersands. But what I guess I would do is I would take in a reference to a string, and then I would say, you know, something, some other variable should be um, uh, should be should hold on to the answer that comes back from two uppercase. Now we can pass in a reference here in case we want to use data again later. Um, we can uppercase it, store the answer in a different variable. Uh, which is of type string, not reference to string, and then use that. In fact, if we wanted to, we could even give this variable the same name. And that would still work, but it might be a little confusing. And we still get Rust is great. So yeah, now this doesn't obey the comment because the comment says should take ownership. So my first answer was the right answer. Let's go back to that. But that's not how I'd write this code. It's weird. Like we're changing the ownership that of this variable just because we want to reuse this variable here to hold on to the answer that comes back from two uppercase. Nevertheless, we followed the instructions. All right, so let's look at uh, section one, error propagation. So it just says follow the instructions. So let's do that. So this is about error propagation. Now, um, the, the word wrapping in this is um, doing my head in. So I think what I can do is I can edit a file called, I think it's called Rust Fumet. And let me double check. Let me double check. I've got it written down here. Yeah, rustfumet.toml. And, oops, paste in. Uh, oh, no, there you go. Yeah. Copy that. I forgot to copy it. Um, paste in our Rust format instructions, which is just that we want our max width to be 80. Now I should be able to do cargo format. Oh, I'm in the wrong directory. Oops. I should be able to do cargo format. And with any luck, the word wrapping will. No. That didn't help. Oh, Vim will do it for me. Okay, so we can get our word wrapping. Okay, by just using Vim. Something about cargo format doesn't um, appear to be wrapping comments. I think I've noticed that before. All right, anyway. So I've uh, sorry. I apologise. I've edited this file, but only so I can so the word wraps a bit less painful for me. All right. So this is a very basic Rust implementation that approximates the WC program, which basically counts the number of uh, lines or words in a file. So let's run this program like they suggest. Cargo run, and then the name of the, this program itself. So if we do cargo run, source main.rs, um, it prints some warnings, but then it tells us how many words, lines, and bytes there are in this file. So this program already works. Uh, and we're going to talk about error handling in this program. Because reading a, a, a line in a file can fail, for example, if it's not valid due to have eight, might be rare. And the code just currently just panics by calling unwrap. Um, and so we panic if uh, things go wrong. And yeah, well, one reason we could fail would be that opening a file would fail. So let's try out the thing they suggest, which is running it on something that is not a text file. That didn't work. I'm somehow not copying that. Okay, 
So we run it on a file that is not a text file, and we get a panic because we ran unwrap on a result. The result was an error that said stream did not contain valid UTF-8, and it was on line 39 that we panicked. So let's have a quick look at line 39. So here's where we do the unwrap. Okay, fine. So we understand so far. So our tasks. Change the function read lines and count bytes and lines so they return a result instead of panicking when they go wrong. And then handle that result in main, reporting any error that occurred in main, using e println. Fair enough. Okay, and look, it even tells us what to change the signatures to. So right now, read lines takes in a file name and returns a lines of buff reader of file. So there's no possibility of anything going wrong. It has to return a lines. So instead of that, let's make it do what they told us to do and make it return a result of lines. Um, and you can see uh, it's unhappy. And the reason it's unhappy is because lines returns a lines object, not a result. Um, but file open might fail, and that's why we're doing this. As, as this comment says, it could easily fail. So what we can do is this. Now what this means is, if this fails, return, immediately stop and return an error. That's what question mark means. So that is... Um, by changing this, the signature of this function so it could return an error and adding the question mark, um, which means return early if you if you get an error from this open function and make that be the error that we return from the main function. Um, we've got almost the whole way, but what we're missing is that in the in a happy case when we've got when when the file did open and we've got some lines to return, we need to re still return a result, right? Because we changed the signature of the function to be a result so that we could use question mark. So what we need to do is wrap this thing up saying that everything went okay. And the answer is this, these lines thing. And so that is that okay blah, I mean, is actually now of the right type. It's of type result, lines, buff reader, file. I mean, comma, IO error, but in this case, it's not an error. All right, so we've done read lines. Let's do count bytes and lines, and it's the same story. Um, we we'll change the signature what, to what they suggest, and we'll look at what might fail. And the thing that might fail is turning this line into some text. So line has um, lines. is I'm a bit confused so lines yeah lines call is the result of calling read lines oh yeah yeah sorry my editor is confused so we changed the type of read lines so it returns a result and that means it might have failed when we get to here so now the type of lines has changed to be a result but we don't want to continue with the rest of our stuff whoops if it's all went wrong so if lines, if read lines failed, we want to exit immediately from count bytes and lines. So we're going to use another question mark, just like we did before, which is going to immediately return the error if an error comes from read lines. So now the type of lines is a lines. And now the type of line is a result of string or error. So basically, when we iterate through lines, um, every time round that loop, just because of the way lines works, which is this function on buff reader, instead of giving us a string every time it, it finds a line of text, it actually gives us a result of, um, it gives us a result of either a string or an error because there was some invalid UTF-8 in this line, which makes it fail. And that's why we've got the unwrap here to turn this line into a text, which is of type string. So, um, the comment says this will usually not fail, but we want to handle the failure. So what we can do is again use the question mark operator, like so. And what that means is, if this came out as an error, then return that error immediately, otherwise carry on and give me back the string. So the type of text is string as before. 
Um, and the, again, we've got the same problem we had before, which was that um, we're returning this tuple, but it was supposed to be returning a result of a tuple. So everything went OK if we get this far. So we're going to wrap this up in an OK. And that's pretty much the story of um, error handling when things are nice, which is basically you put in question marks for all the stuff that might go wrong, and then the last line is an, an OK line to say everything went OK. All right, so we've done our first task, which was change the functions and make them propagate errors. And now our second task is kind of naturally being shown to us by the compiler, which is handle those errors, reporting it using ePrintLearn. So first of all, just to demonstrate how far we've got, let's just unwrap in main. So we're not doing the task yet. We're just, we're just trying to check that that first task that we were given, let's get rid of those comments, is actually working. So let's run our program again. First of all, we'll run it on a file that is a text file, and it's still working. It's still printing out a number of lines, words, and bytes. So now let's run it on a binary file. And we're still getting a panic. The same same thing, stream did not contain valid UTF-8. But this time the panic was on line 50 of main.rs. So line 50 is where we added this new unwrap, because basically count bytes and lines now returns a result. So in order to get hold of this tuple of lines, words, and bytes, um, we need to unwrap it, or what we chose to do was unwrap it. So let's undo that, because that's wrong. Oops. And see that the compiler's unhappy. Well, you know, the compiler definitely ought to be unhappy. Um, and let's just run the compiler here and check it is. Yeah, so the compiler is unhappy. I don't know why it's not highlighting it here. Um, and we need to handle the case that uh, this all went wrong and print out the answer. So what we should do is we should say if let. I mean, this is. Yeah, let's let's see whether this is the right way to do it. So we're going to use an if let, and we're going to say if if we, what you got back was an OK, then do this. Actually, there's, I've already decided that's not what we want to do. Instead of that, we're going to match. We're going to match on it. So first of all, we're going to get the answer out. So um, let's call it answer because I can't think of a better name right now. And we're going to get the result that we got back from counting the bytes and lines, put it in answer, and then we're going to do a match on answer and do different things based on whether it was OK or an error. So to say it was OK, we're going to do this. Uh, we need not, we need more brackets there. So if it was an OK, then um, it's gonna then the, the inside is gonna be a tuple, three li three long, which is gonna we're gonna immediately unpack into lines, words, and bytes, and then we're gonna print um, then we're gonna print out those lines, words, and bytes. Um, so that's handling the happy case where we got back an OK, but the compiler's complaining because we didn't handle the bad case. So let's ask it to fill in the match arms, and it will give us an error case. And let's say that the error is going to be called E. And it, what it told us to do was do an in E print learn. It's going to be something like error. E, something like that. So let's try running that program. First of all, let's run it in the happy case again, just to make sure that still works. Yep. And now let's run it in the sad case and see what it says. And it does what we wanted, which is it prints out error. Stream did not contain valid UTF-8, but without all of that panic stuff, it just prints out the error. And because we used ePrintLearn, that's printing it to standard error instead of standard output. You can't see the difference here in the terminal. So one other thing that I would just like to demonstrate for you, just in case you're wondering, is we got this extra stuff printed out here. And that's because of we, we did Cargo Run. But what Cargo Run did was actually it built an executable and then ran it. And the executable that it ran is actually printed out here for us. So let's just... 
I just want to demonstrate to you that this is just building a, an executable program called error propagating, which, which is what, which is actually doing what we want without all this extra, uh, guff being written out. So when I ran the program itself and gave it main.rs, all it did was print it out what we wanted. And similarly, if I do the same thing, but I, I give it slash bin slash bash, all it prints out is error string did not contain valid UTF-8. So you can see that error message, by the way, is partly created by us. We wrote the word error, and then the rest here is um, the the error that came back from this count bytes and lines function. And this error this ca that came back from count bytes and lines function actually came from this question mark here. Um, so that's the inside there, the code that, um, well, actually that, comes from the lines function, which creates this uh, lines object. And that lines object is an iterator. And when you iterate over it, what you get back is a result. And the error part of the result is the thing that actually contained this string. Stream did not contain valid UTF-8. Anyway, that's all just in case you're interested. All right, so let's go on to the next example, or the next exercise. So the instructions here are just follow the comments. It says don't take too much time on the extra assignment. Instead, come back later once you've done the rest of the exercises. Spelt wrong. Okay, so let's read the comments. Let's just fix the wrapping a bit. Okay, this is an unfinished implementation of the well-known merge sort algorithm. So first of all, fix the language problems in the function merge, then finish the implementation of the function merge sort. And then there's an extra challenge, which we won't look at yet. So fix the language problems in the function merge. Okay, so here's the function merge. And we've got some compile errors. Let's print them out. Let's let's get those compile errors on the console, just in case. Okay, so mismatch types. Um, we're trying to push into dest. Um, and what we pushed in there is an i32. But then later we push in an, a reference to an i32. So one of these must be wrong. And let's try and think about which is the right thing. So dest is a vec, and it's, we're going to return it. So we want it to be a vec of i32. Uh, and here we appear to be pushing in uh, i32s. But here we're pushing in a reference to an i32. Um, so we can change that by just um, dereferencing LM. So we're looping through a slice here, and we probably want that to remain a slice. We don't want to consume A. I don't, can we even consume A? No, this is a this is slice syntax, these dot dot here. So um, we're saying, give me this subsection of A as a slice. And so each element in there will be a reference to an i32 because it's a reference to this this element in the slice. We want to push in an actual i32, not a reference to an i32, so we dereference it here. This would not work if LM was not copy. Um, if if an if an i32 was not copy, we would have to do LM dot clone like this. If it was something like a, a string or something like that, that can't be copied. Um, we'll get to that. Um, so we could do this, but actually um, just dereferencing it with a star is fine. And then there's another problem here, which is that we're trying to loop through um, a slice of B. Um, but well, this is not the way you say a slice of B. You have to say ampersand B. Do that. And now for some reason we don't get the same problem. I think, yeah, it's the same problem. So there we go. So those are our first problems all fixed. We're looping through a slice of A and a slice of B, and in each case we're pushing into destination a dereference of that element. Now we've got another problem, which is that we're trying to change A IDX and B IDX, neither of which are mutable. So let's make them both mutable like so. That should be simple enough. Is that all of our problems? 
we've got a warning. Oh, merge is never used. All right, so we can, don't need to worry about that yet. Um, it looks like the merge function, let's just check the compile. Yeah, it looks like the merge function compiles okay, but this um, code doesn't actually do anything yet. So I guess we have to think about um, how this code actually works. I haven't really looked at how merge works, and I don't think I'm going to, right? That's not really the exercise. Um, but we need to think about how merge sort works, because um, we're going to need to implement it. But let's first of all look at what main does. All right, so it, it main reads in some numbers that we pass into it, and then sorts them, and then prints them out. Um, and we have a test. We have tests for merge sort. That's good. That's helpful. So let's just try running the program as it is now. Like so. All right. So it managed to um, it managed to understand my input and try uh, said it was going to sort this data, and then it panicked because we hadn't actually finished the program because on line forty one. We've got this to do, which panics. Now let's try running the tests. So the test failed because of the same thing. We haven't actually implemented it yet. OK, so merge sort takes in a slice of i32s and returns a vec of i32s, which have been sorted. Um, and if if we only have one or zero items, then we just, they're already sorted, we just turn them into a vec and return them. So that case should already pass, right? So this case here should pass, this case here should pass, and we should have failed at line 79. Is that what we did? Um, oh, we need a backtrace. Let's, let's, let's run our test with a backtrace. And yeah, look, the, the place where we went wrong was on line 79, because line 79 needs to actually sort 1, 2, 3. And that means it will, uh, 1, 2, 3 has a length of greater than 1, so it'll get to here and it'll crash. So um, what's the implementation? All right, so let's stop putting it off. So what, how does merge work? OK, so it says merge two slices that are already sorted and turn the answer into a vector. OK, so how do you do merge sort? Um, We, I guess, need to look up how how you implement merge sort, don't we? Am I supposed to just already know this? Let's see whether hopefully Wikipedia will tell us. I mean, I'm sure I do know this if I thought about it, right? Okay, so divide the unsorted list into two sublists, into n sublists, each containing one element. And then merge the sublist to produce new sorted sublists until there's only one sublist remaining. This will be the sorted list. So, recursively splits the list into sublists until the sublist size is one, then merges those sublists to produce a sorted list. So, Sounds more complicated than I was expecting to be asked to do in this exercise. Maybe I'm making it harder than it is. Maybe this one is going to be more like what we're doing because it deals with lists. So we make the left and the right be empty lists. And we split it into two. So these are non-sorted. It's just splitting this list into two halves. And then and then we say, please sort the left half and the right half, and then we merge them together. OK, that's the right thing to do. That was the part I was missing, that we're going to recursively call merge sort ourselves. So um, we want to split the list into two. Sort each half, 
merge the two halves. Those are our steps. Oh, this is fun, isn't it? I wasn't expecting proper coding. All right, so split the list into two. Um, I happen to know that there is a split function or something like that. Um, oh, is it partition? Um, there is definitely a way of getting two slices. I guess we can just, I guess we can just take two slices, can't we? Oh, here we are, here we are. Oh, no, this is just taking the first and the last one. Oh, yeah, we don't want that. Um, I guess we could do chunks exact. Chunk, maybe chunks exact, or split out, split out. Yeah, split out is the thing I was thinking of. Divides one slice into two at an index. That's what we want. What's split? Yeah, we want split at the midpoint. So we want... Um, uh, what should we call these? Um, first, second... So we're gonna. It's gonna return split out. It's gonna return a tuple. I assume. Oh yeah, two slices. The first and the second half of this data. And we need to decide where we're gonna split it first. So we're gonna say let mid equal data dot len divided by two. Uh, it's complaining at us because we're not returning a vec, which is really annoying. Let's just let's just put in our to-do again to make this stop complaining at us for a second. All right, so we find the midpoint of the list, and we split it into two. Now we've got two lists. Now we need to sort each of those. Which we can do by calling merge sort on them. So calling ourselves recursively, like so. And now it's moaning that first and second are not used. So that was sort each half. And now we need to merge the two halves by returning merge first, second. And these are vex, and they're supposed to be slices, so we can just take a reference to each of those. Um, because first and second are vex, because merge sort returns a vec, but if we just take a reference to them, that becomes a slice, because merge takes two slices. So with any luck, we've implemented it correctly. Now we've got tests, so we can check. Our tests pass. All right, so let's try running this program. So one two three comes out as one two three, which is correct. What about three two three comes out as two three three? All right, so it does indeed sort our things. It does an awful lot of creating vex and so on, doesn't it, to do that? But on the other hand, it does. The merge sort does have some nice properties. Okay, so that was finished the implementation of the function merge sort. Now the extra is tr is try changing the type from i thirty two into string everywhere. All right, so let's just replace i32 with string everywhere. And see how that goes. Now, I think we've already talked about what will go wrong here. Yeah, so it doesn't like it because um, we're doing a lot of moving. Um, and they're not, these things are not copies, so they'll actually get moved out and that's not okay. So let's have a look at where it's got a problem. So each of these is going to need cloning. Now string does implement clone. So I guess we can do this and then we'll think about, now this is, remember I said um, uh, we could have done, we would have needed dot clone instead of star lm um, when we were doing, 
when we were changing this line before. So I think this will work. And it seems to work. And let's just try um, zoo um, aardvark. Comes out as aardvark zoo, so they are sorted. Um, so it does work. Now, is, it, is this right? Or is there something better we can do? We've, we've been given a slice of strings. And we need to put something into um, a vec of string. Yeah, we've got to clean it. I think I can't think of anything. Well, what we could do, I guess, is start uh, um, passing around vecs of references to strus everywhere. Um, and then, yeah, if we were lucky and we got that right, and there would be some lifetime pain to that. Um, then we could do it without any copying. But this works. This works if you're okay with all that copying. All right, I think we've done challenge number two. Let's have a quick check. Um, what challenge number three says? It just says, follow the instructions in the comments. All right, so let's have a look at number three. All right. Oh, there's a lot of comments in here. Let's, um, let's format them before we do anything else so that they at least vaguely fit on the screen. Okay, so... While taking first stab at programs, using Panic is a quick and dirty way to do error handling, but Panic has the obvious drawback that it is an all or nothing. You can't recover from it. I mean, you can, but you basically shouldn't. Let's say that. Um, consider this program, Interactive Hello World, which is a bit fussy about what's a valid name. The intent, the intent is that the program repeats the question if you are, enter an invalid name. So first of all, take a few moments to read and understand various parts of this program. Note, we're sorry about the poor formatting. Please fix it yourself. Cargo format is your friend. Okay. I think I, I'm... No, it hasn't fixed. Oh, good. Okay, so we can do a cargo format. So, yes, look how wrong this looks. This is all flying off. There's a gap in here. Um, this isn't indented properly. So let's cargo format this. And... Oh yeah, I'd already I'd already changed it, so I'll just reload that. Uh, now that means I need to reformat these strings as well. Save that. Okay, so um, and actually my my vim will format on save. So all right, so it says take a few moments to read and understand the code. Now that it's been formatted, we've probably got a better chance of reading it and understanding it. So let's have a quick look. All right, so we've got some imports. Um, We've got an, a custom error type that we've invented. Um, and we've made sure that it is debug. And then we've got a function called get username that returns a string. And it inter it's like an interactive function. So it prints out username. It, uh, it Make sure that's got printed by flushing standard out. Then it creates a new string and it calls read line to read in a string from the user being typed in. Then it trims it. Then it says, if any of these letters is not alphabetic, it's not allowed in the name. So apologies to those of you who have non-alphabetic letters in your name. Apparently it's not allowed. Um, and then also if it's empty, it says it's not a valid name and it panics. And then fails. So it's not doing what the, the intention is, which is to keep asking until you pass in, until you type in a, what it considers a valid name. Instead it's panicking. So we don't want to do that. So... Besides the explicit panics, there's a second source of errors that this program currently ignores. What are these? Okay, so I guess um, there could be some I.O. errors. Yeah, look, this read line returns an I.O. result, but we're not actually looking at that. Now, I think that should print a, an error if we compile, yeah, it does. So look, um, everywhere where we've done IO type stuff and we haven't checked the outcome from it, we get this warning, unused result that must be used. So there's stood out flush and there's read line. Um, also, we're not actually using this my error, thing, but we will, okay, fine. All right, so I think we've answered that question. 
We've provided an error type for properly reporting all errors that get username might generate. Change the function get username so that it returns a result of string comma my error. Tip to keep your main working, you can temporarily unwrap it. Fine. So let's get result string my error as the return value of get username. And then let's do what they recommend, which is unwrap that here. And we'll deal with it in a second. Um, well, we haven't actually tried out this program yet. Just Let's just undo and try out the program. And be patient. All right. So it's running. And if we type in an invalid name, it panics. But if we type in a valid name, it says hello to us. And what about if we type in a non-alphanumeric name? It panics. Okay, so it's it's working as we expected it to work. So now let's go back to what we were doing. So first of all, now get username returns a result. And that means we need to return OK of that in the happy case. Now let's think a little bit about the unhappy cases. So let's start off with the less obvious case, which is these IO errors. So if we flush um, and it fails, we want to return question mark. Um, oh, sorry, we want to return an error immediately by using question mark. But that doesn't actually work at the moment because you can't convert the error that comes from flush, which is an IO result, IO error into a my error. But there's an easy way of doing this conversion. So there's two things we could do. First thing is we could say map error like this. And then we could say, can you please make a my error, IO error, out of the error that we got? And then question mark it. So this will work, right? We're saying map error basically means if it's an error, run this code and create this IO error out of the error E we were given. The type of E is, is IO error, uh, IO colon colon error. Um, so that's OK, but it's not as good as this, which I'm going to do. Impl from IO error for my error. So I'm going to make a conversion that can convert an IO error into a my error. And the conversion is pretty easy. Uh, the conversion is basically what we did below. So it's just this. We're just saying, oh, it's an IO error. So wrap it up as a my error that um, is built. Um, it's wrap it up in my error using the variant of my error that is designed for exactly this purpose, to hold on to an IO error. What that means is that we don't need this anymore. Because what's really clever about question mark is not only does it, does it notice an error and immediately return, it also does a conversion as well. If you've got a conversion function implemented like this, it will automatically convert from an IO error into a my error, now that we've given it a way of doing that. All right, so that's one of the IO errors. The other IO error that could happen is here. And we can do exactly the same thing. And now we're reusing this code. So that's why the map error thing wasn't so good because it, we'd have to write it every time. And it's just, it's, it's just uh, messier, isn't it? This code, like we don't want that map error code messing up this code. Instead, we've got a conversion here that, that so everything's explicit still, but the question mark is just um, a very succinct way of saying do the conversion and return. Okay, so that was handling I.O. errors that might happen. So we've still got this type of error, haven't we? Um, which is uh, currently a panic, and we want it to instead to be an error. So we can just return my error, colon, colon, invalid name. And we can do the same thing here. And if we wanted to, by the way, we could have multiple variants in here. We could have non-alphabetic name instead of invalid name, and we could have empty name here. So given all of that, oh, it's not quite right, because we would need to return a result. So we can't just return the error type. We have to return a result which contains the error type. 
So we do this because error means um, uh, is a way of constructing a result. By the way, in case you didn't spot it, that's actually shorthand for result colon colon error, which is how we normally have to write enums. But because result is so um, ubiquitous, we we um, we have the word error available in our namespace immediately. Okay, so now get username returns errors when there's an IO error using the question mark operator, and then explicitly returns errors when something goes wrong in its own implementation. So if we run the program now, it should still work, and we should be able to say, my name is Andy, and it says, hello, Andy. Or if we use an empty name, it panics in a nasty way, it just says invalid name. So it's actually got worse than it, it was before. Um, and also if it's a non-numeric name, same thing. So we've got, we, everything's got slightly worse, but we're on the way to being better. So the problem here is that we have put in this unwrap that we did a second ago. So now get username when it fails. Um, uh, we just panic. So we don't want to do that. Instead, we want to say, um, we want a loop that says, when we've got, as long as we've got errors, then keep on looping, otherwise stop. So um, I guess we could do, I don't like unconditional looping, but we could do this. Um, we could say if let, if that name is was okay, then print hello name. We'd better stop as well, hadn't we? So I guess we could put in a break here. So break out of the loop. Oops, should be a semicolon. Um, and then we need to print something if it all goes wrong, don't we? And what we printed before was along the lines of, that's not a valid name, wasn't it? Let's say that's not considered a valid name by, um, well, by who? Someone, by someone. Inconsiderate. Um, because who are we to judge what's a valid name and what's not? So look, it says, hello, Andy. But then if we give an empty name, it says, that's not considered a valid name. And it asks us again. And we can give it an odd name. And it's still not considered a valid name. But if we say, fine, then it says, hello, fine. So I believe we've implemented what they asked us to do. So the main thing here is that we made get username return a result. We used question mark for some of the errors. We explicitly returned errors in other cases. And then we used um, if let to detect whether the return value here, this name thing, which is a result, was an okay. And if it was an okay, then we can, whoops, then we can stop. And if it wasn't okay, we print something else and go back around the loop. So I'm not particularly happy with using an infinite loop here. Um, I would like to think we could think of a way of using some kind of while let or something. You know, we could do this. Let name equal error. Um, so we could set it up as an invalid name at the beginning, and then we could say while uh, name dot is error get another name and then we could do once we come out of the loop yeah I think this will be this is better right I guess we need an if here though it's still not great is it because we still have to do ask this thing twice about is it an error I think this works. Let's try it. Oh, no, because, yeah. 
So we still have to do the... Ah, oh, it's nasty, it's nasty. Let's go back to how we were. I'm sure there'll be a nicer way of doing this, but I can't think of it right now. Anyway, it works. Fine. Um, all right. Tip. Finally, handle the errors in main properly. An I.O. error should quit the program. Oh, an I.O. error should quit the program. But after an invalid error, it should repeat the question to the user. Um, fine. All right, so we haven't quite done it yet. Um, let's check what an I.O. error does. So we can simulate an I.O. error by interrupting the stream. No, no, not that. Control D? Yeah. Yeah, so if we say Control D, we're not able to exit the program, but Control D means like end the stream. So that shouldn't that shouldn't be happening, I think. I think I've triggered an I.O. error there. I'm not absolutely sure. Okay, so we've got to do something even worse than this. We've got to say, let's do a match, and then we'll feel a little bit happy about this, right? Match name. If it's okay. Notice, by the way, I'm making a new variable called name here, which is shadowing the old variable. Um, so this could be called... Um, well, this could be called result or something like that. Um, if you don't like shadowing names, then we could do this instead. The, when you get used to shadowing names, it, like it's really great. But just to demonstrate the point, I'll do that. And we need some more things. So um, at the moment, we're saying if it's just an error, then print out then print out this stuff. So let's do that, and then I'll change um, to what I was really going to do. So that should, if I get the syntax right, that should do exactly what we used to do. Let's double check, shall we? Um, hello, Asaf. That's not considered a valid name. Empty is not considered a valid name. Control D also not considered a valid name. So we want to distinguish between the different types of error. And that's why I wrote this match statement here, because my error, IO error, should quit. And my error, invalid name, should not quit. So here we should, um, what should we do? I mean, we should probably panic. What did it say? What did it say? An IO should quit the program. So, all right, let's not panic. Let's just print out IO error. And then um, break. Should be good enough. And then if we've got an invalid name, we print invalid name and we'll repeat the loop. Yeah, it feels really fragile to me to have these breaks in here. Uh, but yeah, there we go. All right, so we type in a valid name, we get greeted. Type in an invalid name, we get told that that's not good enough. If the stream ends, oh, that's just, yeah. How am I going to make an IO error? I mean, I guess, I guess we could do this. No, that's not working. All right. Um, we haven't managed to trigger the IO error part of this. And I guess, yeah, I, those two things that I were doing were just closing the stream, which is not an error. Um, so I'm not sure how I'm going to make this happen, I guess. I guess I could try and make it read from a file that doesn't exist. That might work. I could close stood out. What if I close stood out before we um, try and flush it? Can you close stood out? No, 
No. Um, I could lock stood out. That might cause a problem. Should we lock it? And then let's just drop X at the end just to make sure. I'm going to give up on this thing, but yeah, let's try. I shouldn't have done that. I should have just done cargo run. Okay, that did not help. What if we lock stood in? We're definitely trying to use stood in. No, it's just freezing us. Okay, fine. I don't know how to trigger an, an IO error, but I can fake one um, by saying... Um, can I fake one? Not easily. It's quite annoying, I think. All right, never mind. I, I, you'll have to believe me that if there was some kind of I/O error, and I'm sure you're screaming at the screen about how we can make one, um, then this question mark would have caused us to return a, I, a my error I/O error, and then this code will match on that and print out the error and break. And uh, without tests and without being able to try it out, we have no idea whether it really does, but I kind of think it probably does. Okay, so exercise four, follow the instructions. So let's have a look at this. First, let's fix the formatting. Below you'll find the small a small start of a data model a data type modeling abstract syntax tree for an expression and a small evaluator function. So we're writing a little programming language here. So it says extend the evaluator in the following ways. Add support for multiplication and division. Um, and we've allowed summing a list. Why can we get away with vec express enough in that case instead of box of vec of express? Okay, so we'll answer that in a second. And then we'll think about division failing. So first of all, add support for modification and division. So first of all, let's just try and understand the program, shall we? So we've, there's this thing called expra, which is presumably an expression. There's different types of things. It can be a constant, an addition, a subtraction, a variable, I guess that is, or a, so what that is, or a summation. Um, and we're just allowing const, summation, and var to exist as names. Well, we are to do expert colon colon everywhere. Okay. So, um, what the main function does is run some tests. So it tests out whether const5 prints out const5 presumably. So let's run it. Oh, we're using a few, um, uh, dependencies here. So, const5 when var is 107 prints out, gives an answer of 5. var with var equals 90 gives an answer of 90. Um, substitute var, oh, so, sorry, subtract var, subtract 5 from var when var is 36 gives 31. Subtract var from var when var is 87 gives 0, fair enough. Subtract um, 5 from var, and then add 5 to var when var is minus 88. Should give minus 88, fair enough. And then the summation of a vector of var and const 1 when var is minus 61, that should add up to 60, fair enough. So all of that stuff works, but we haven't done any division or multiplication in our tests. I'm not sure, by the way, why these are, are not tests. Oh, there are tests too, okay, so... Well, let's wrap this a bit. So let's just do a cargo test as well. And okay, the tests all pass as well. So let's try some more test cases and get them to fail. Uh, exercise tests. Exercise cases. Terrible name for a test. Instead, let's say uh, 
Multiplication works as expected. All right, so um, let's do some. Oh yeah, by the way, we didn't look at all the program, did we? So um, well, there are these convenience functions that just are an easy way of doing an add, which boxes up the stuff inside. Just because you need those, because these this add and sub are boxes. Um, because we don't really know what type it's the the left and right things are, so this is the way to have like kind of unknown type. Is that right? We do know what type they are though. Their type is expra. Why are these boxes? Oh, because it's recursive. Yeah, so you can't have an expra inside an expra because it would go, it would expand forever. So instead, it's like a pointer to an expra. Fine. Okay. So there, yeah, this is the convenience functions um, for adding and creating expressions that are based on an add or a subtract. So these test cases say things like uh, evaluate a subtraction of var and five. So we're going to do. Evaluate the multiplication. What did we call that? Mul. Evaluate the multiplication of two constants. Uh, three and five should come out as 15. What is x? Oh, x is the variable. So. Okay, I don't know why we're not just putting a constant in here. In this case, it actually doesn't matter what the variable is. I presume, let's have a look at eval. Eval takes in, yeah, an expression and then or the value of the variable, I presume that is. So let's have a look at eval. Yeah, so this is the, eval is the function that does the magic, right? It takes in an expression, takes in what the variable should be and returns an i64. Uh, and we'll get to that part later. So what it does is, based on the type of the expression it's been given, it, it figures out an i64 from that. So if it's a variable, if it's if it's a var, that means the variable, and we've been told what the variable is. So we just return it. If it's a const, then you just return what's in that const. And if you add, you have to do Evaluate the left-hand side, and then add it to evaluating the right-hand side. Similarly, for subtraction. Um, oh, and then summation is a bit more complicated. We have to add them all up, return the answer. OK, so that was how eval works. So now let's write our test for multiplying 3 by 5 to get 15. In a minute, we'll try multiplying by a variable, right? But first of all, let's just multiply two constants. So now if we do cargo test, it should fail. All right, so let's normally then we'd once now we've got a failing test, we would normally um, uh, immediately make it pass. But I, I think when I make it pass, I'm going to make it um, pass quite comprehensively. So I'd just like to make sure I've got a test that checks that we're actually evaluating variables as well, and that, that works too. So now we've got two tests that do multiplication. One multiplies two constants, one multiplies a constant by the variable, and the, uh, yeah, give the right, they give the answer you get by multiplying. Okay, so now let's implement some multiplying. So first of all, we're going to need an expression type called multiply, which again, it, take, it combines two things together, so it's like sub. Um, and uh, we're going to implement mul very much the way subtraction got implemented. So this, what this function does is it just constructs an expression of type mul. It doesn't actually do anything, which is why it's a very dull implementation. Uh, and then we're getting an error because we're not handling the case where we've been asked to multiply two numbers in eval. So we're going to multiply left by the right by evaluating the left and evaluating the right, and then multiplying the two values together. And with any luck, we're done. Let's try and see whether the test pass. 
Yep, test pass. All right, so that was easy. Now let's try division. Um, and let's just try dividing. Um, let's try dividing 10 by 2 to get 5. And let's try dividing um, 64 by 8. No, no. Um, 4. And that should be. The answer to that is 12, right? No, that's 48. How did I manage? Yeah, all right. So divide 48 by 4. I get the answer 12. I think, I think that's right. All right, so uh, um, now these are both. That's wrong for a start. So these are both div. Um, we haven't implemented div yet, so this should fail. But also, let's try dividing by 0. And I don't know what the answer should be here. So let's just put in a to do for now. So run the test and it fails. Oh, it fails. Yeah, it fails at line 46. Not yet implemented. So not my new to do, but this old to do here. Now, what is it complaining about? It says mild is never used, but it is used. Oh, it's not used in, it's only used in test. All right, so let's just use it in, in the reel to stop, make that error go away as well. Multiply five by five, that'll do, okay. And let's also do the same thing for div, shall we, just to make, so if we divide, oh, that should be just, sorry, multiply 5 by 5, divide var by 5, when var is, oh, um, I don't know what var is. Oh, it's random, fine. Multiply var by 5. So I divide var by 5. Print out the answer. Let's try running it, shall we? It's going to fail because it's not yet implemented. But look, the multiplying 5 by 5 did print out 25. So that did work. All right, so division is failing because it's not implemented. So let's implement it. So first of all, just the, the dumb bit, which is just store it. And this, this is just a convenience function. Uh, but we haven't actually defined a div variant. But now we have, because it's that easy. And now we've got the real error, which is that we're not evaluating this. So let's do that. And we need to divide by the right hand side to the most plane. Now when we run it, it says, look, dividing 96 by 5 gives 19. That might be right. Um, and the test should, the first set of tests that we run should pass. And then we've got a panic at main.rs line 61. Ah, interesting. So we didn't actually get to my to do. Um, even though we're getting warned, the to-do will mess everything up. So maybe I'll just change that because it's making a lot of noise. Let's imagine for a second that dividing 48 by 0 should produce 0. And instead we get a panic saying attempt to divide by 0. So let's read our um, question. Since division can fail... All right, well, let's answer this question first. So we've done normal division. Let's just let's just satisfy ourselves that normal division works fine as long as we don't divide by zero. Yes, our tests all passed. Fine. Now let's answer this question. Um, we've added the form summation representing the sum of a list of expressions. Question, why can we write vec of expr instead of box of vec of expr? So that's here. 
So the answer is that a VEC is a bit like a box. A box is a pointer that points at a version of XPR. Now, the reason why we need boxes is what I was saying earlier, which is that this is a recursive definition. So you can't have uh, an expression that holds an expression inside itself, because that expression might hold another expression inside itself, which might hold another expression inside itself, and we go on forever. So we have to have a pointer to an expression that is somewhere else, and that's what box is giving us. So basically, a box is a pointer to, over there, there's another expression. Um, which you own, but it's not in the same bit of memory as you. And VEC is basically the same, except instead of saying over there there is an expression, it says over there there is a list of expressions. And underneath VEC is a bit like a, a box of array, I guess you'd say. Um, so it, this summation doesn't need a box wrapping expr because it's already got a VEC wrapping expr which does the same job of saying this thing or this list of things, is not in the same bit of memory as us. It's somewhere else. That's my answer to that question. All right, so, since division can fail, the function of L needs to return an option where none indicates that division by zero has occurred. Can you change the code so that the errors are propagated correctly? Hint, use the question marks in text. Fine. So, the bit that might go wrong is eval, right? Because we might divide by zero. So we're going to return an option of I64, as the comment says. And most of these are going to be fine. Oh, we should... This is going to be... Um, it says hint use a question mark operator. So, I think what we should do is... We should wrap all of this in an OK. So let's say answer... Let's make this... It's going to look pretty nasty if we don't do this. So let's say, give, put the answer in here, and then we're going to return OK of answer. And now we're returning a result. No, not OK, sorry, it should be some answer, because it's returning an option. Um, so answers type should be I64, so we're returning some i64. Now, why have we got errors here? Oh, because eval itself, yeah, um, because this is calling ourselves recursively, and now the um, return type of eval is now option, so you can't plus together two options. So what we need to do is, if something goes wrong, bail out. So did you know you can use question mark on an option as well as on a result? Oops. So you can say, if it's a none, immediately return a none. Otherwise, um, give me what's inside it. That's what question mark means, right? So it's similar to doing question mark on a result, but now we're just saying if it's none, then return immediately. So now we've got back the same behavior we had before, hopefully, um, except here. We need to handle the fact that this is um, uh, that this gives us back an option as well. So what should we do with this? I guess we should say let answer equal, let's run this, do the sum here. And then in, and then basically we should say let string, like string form of the answer equal if some ants equals ants, then just turn it into a string. Otherwise, um, division by zero. Should we, what should we say? Let's just say division by zero. Let's be explicit um, I'm really I'm really confused here aren't I no I just, I just I'm just missing the word let oh this should be a string that we're returning 
So I like to use two owns to turn a string slice into a string. Okay, so now I've made it compile. Let me try and explain what I did. So before we were getting back an answer, which is now an option instead of just being an i64. So we need to make a string which represents that answer. So what we say is if um, if if this is a sum, I um, there's something in it. Get that, put it in ants, and then turn it into a string, and put that into a string ants. Otherwise, um, the answer is division by zero. Uh, two owned means turn it to a string. Now we've got a string called str ants that we can substitute in here. So that's how to handle the errors in the main method. Now, of course, um, that means that all the answers in here um, that we're testing for are no longer correct because it doesn't return a, a 5 anymore, it returns some 5. So I think we've just got to wrap all of these in some like this. I've just recorded the macro that hopefully wraps a thing in a sum. Seems to work. And that answers the question of what, what should we have in that final assertion, because it should be none. Right? Looks good. So yeah, if we try and divide by zero, we get back none. So this isn't going to work yet. But at least um, we've written the code that we think should run. So what happens when we divide by zero in? Ah, interesting. So in our um, in our our main method, oh, we're not dividing by zero in our main method. Let's divide by zero. And it panics as well. Good. Okay. So now we need to actually fix the bug. So the bug. So notice, by the way, this is very deliberate behavior by me. I make absolutely sure that I've got a test that reproduces the bug before I even allow myself to think about fixing the bug. Um, preferably like this. I reproduce the bug in real life and in a test. Now I've got a failing test. Now I'm safe to fix the bug because I know I've got a test that checks I really fixed it and I wasn't fooling myself. Okay, so what the problem is when this right hand side here is zero. So I guess we need a little bit more logic in here than we had before. We need to say uh, let, um, oh gosh, what are the words for when you're dividing? There's a divisor and a dividend, isn't there? We, uh, I'm not so confident on dividend, but we only need divisor. So we can put this here. Actually, we still want the question mark. Uh, no, 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 device. Um, so, so far we're still doing the same thing. We just split out divisor into its own variable, but now we're going to do if divisor is zero, do something. Otherwise, can type it, do what we used to do. And it shouldn't be that, it should be this. No, it shouldn't be, shouldn't be, sorry. Okay, so this is where this is no longer okay. Well, what we've done here is not okay. How awkward of it. So... Um, I guess we need to put in a return here. And now, now we're okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the problem here was the answer is not an option. It's just an I, I64, and we wrap it later in, as an option of I64 at the end. So I was trying to return an option from here and put it into answer. 
but actually what we wanted was an early return. Same as these question marks here, where we say immediately return none. Well, here we also immediately return none. So, I mean, we could do this instead. But basically, it's not as good as this. So we're just explicitly saying, uh, immediately stop what you're doing and return that. So, okay, with any luck, our tests pass. Yes, nice. And when we try and divide a variable by zero, where a variable is minus 84, we get, instead of getting a number, we get division by zero. So it very much looks like we have done what we're supposed to do. All right, so I noticed there was a little bit at the very end. If you have time enough to want to code more Rust, you can extend this exercise endlessly. I don't think we'll do that. Uh, one idea would be to add a sigma, which computes the equivalent of like adding up from where variable is 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. Um, that would be very cool, but let's not do that now. OK. So we've made our little expression evaluator able to handle multiplying and dividing. And we've handled the fact that sometimes evaluating expressions goes wrong and return none in that case. So that was all right, wasn't it? All right, so number five. It says this is a bonus, so we'll see how we get on with this. Follow the instructions. Fine. So... Um, okay, so this is uh, implementing something called a ring buffer. So one way to implement a queue is to use a linked list, but that requires a lot of dynamic memory. Adding and removing individual items is going to basically allocate memory. So another thing you can do is have a circular buffer, so-called, which is basically a fixed size buffer, which wraps around. The compromise is the capacity of the queue is then fixed. A partial implementation is provided below. Please finish it and add some more methods. Remember to run cargo format and cargo clippy. All right, well, let's run cargo format and cargo clippy right now, shall we? Well, there's more long comments. Let's just shrink those first. And we'll see how far we get with this. If it's too difficult for me, then this video has gone on a while already. OK, so cargo from, oh, let's go into the right directory, shall we? So cargo clippy is the incredibly useful tool that warns us about code that is not very good. Now, for now, it's just saying make box is not used. All right, so let's have a look. Let's read the code, and then we'll look at implementing read. All right, so um, it's a struct called ring buffer. It holds on to some data of fixed size 16, and it remembers the start and the end of where you are in the ring buffer. You can make a new one. Um, read is supposed to do something, but doesn't yet. What write does is says, add a value to the uh, end of the queue. Now this has got wrapped weirdly. Returns false if writing to the queue failed, which can happen if there's not enough room. All right, so this looks like this is implemented. Let's just briefly think about it. So basically what we say is, um, put, put the value we've been given into end, and then add one to end and make sure that it wraps around if it's if we've gone off the end. And then if the position, if we basically just overwrote, now what is this? This is if if we've run out of space. Like we, we successfully wrote this value, but there's no more space for anything else. That's interesting because that's not quite what it says here. It says if writing to the queue failed. But I guess we don't want to always have an extra space. So anyway, if we've if we've now got to the point where we're overlapping with start, return failure. Otherwise, remember that position, which is one more than what end was before, and say we've still got space. Okay, so that was right. Read is still to be done. Write is done. This function creates an own slice. Okay, so we're going to use that in a bit, I think, for one of the exercises. And this is a fun extra bit that we won't think about yet, which allows you to iterate through it. So let's try running it. And it panics because we haven't done read yet. 
Uh, and we haven't done read yet. Because, uh, the reason why read is being used is because the iterator um, uses read to get the next thing. So let's briefly look. I didn't realize the iterator was quite this small. Um, so what we're doing is um, calling read to say, get something out of the queue and return it. That's how we iterate through. And that's how this code works, because we have once we have iterator defined, we can iterate through the elements in the queue and print them out. All right, so what read does, it, I've just worked out from that, is not just um, provide one of the values, but also remove it from the queue. So this is a queue. That's what it said at the beginning. Um, and so you can add something to the queue, or you can remove something from the, I guess, it adds it to the end and removes it from the beginning, I guess. This function tries to read a value from the queue and returns some value. If it succeeds, it returns none. All right, so what we essentially what we're going to we need some tests. We need some tests. All right. Um, this is how we write tests. Should it be called test or test? I don't know. So let's have a test that. Um, tries to read from an empty queue. Reading from an empty queue um, returns none. Right. So let's make an empty queue. And assert. Assert that q.read Can we assert eek? I think we could probably assert eek q.read gives us none I like to do, I like to import um, super colon colon star in my test Some people don't like star, especially not But I do, so oh, this should be mutable, shouldn't it? Oops because, oh, that didn't go very good typing. So it was complaining about how I couldn't call read because read changes queue, because of course it does. Because read doesn't just read, it kind of uh, removes something from the queue. Okay, so that's immediately going to fail, that test, I think. Let's try it. Yes, it failed because read is not yet implemented. So let's write the minimal implementation of read that passes our test. Just double checking. I should be doing this right. Yeah, implement read is my first task. Okay, so I've done the minimal version of read that passes my test. And now my test is passed. Good. Um, so let's just comment out this to make our error messages easier to read. There we go. Right, our, the first test passes, which might make you think it was a dumb test, but it's a useful one to have. So let's write a new test. Um, uh, we read what we wrote in the same order. I believe that's what we want. We want a kind of uh, first in, last out, last in, first out. No, we want first in, first out queue. I'm assuming that's what we want here. So we're going to write some stuff into the queue. Um, Without these asserts, we're just going to write them. Oh, I've got a lot of extra brackets, which I was hoping it was going to delete for me, but it didn't. Okay, so we write one, two, three, four, five into the queue, and now they should come out as one, two, three, four, five, like this. Right, so that test is going to fail, right? Yes, because it return none, returns none every time, and it shouldn't. So we can make this one pass by saying... Um, so basically, when when we return none is when the queue is empty. So when the queue is empty is going to be when self.start equals self.end. And that's why, by the way, um, when self start is about to become equal to self.end then 
we are basically in a kind of failed state. It doesn't really tell us what to do. Like, is the queue just broken at that point? No, I guess, yeah, it like, we wrote, we wrote the answer in here. That feels wrong. Never mind. We'll think about it later. Otherwise, we're going to return some kind of value. And what we're going to return is the value that's at self dot start, right? Self, so self dot data brackets, self dot start. So that's what we're going to return. But this isn't quite going to work yet because we haven't changed start. So the first, the first bit passed, but then we got to line one, two, one. And the second thing we got out, it gave us back some one again. It should have given us some two, and that's because we didn't uh, um, move after reading. So what we actually need to do is say, get hold of that return value. We're going to return it in a second, but we're also going to change self.start to be one bigger. And that's not quite all we need either. But basically we're saying we just used up that thing that was at the beginning of the list. So we're no longer there. Now that's going to work for now, but it doesn't actually work in all cases because it doesn't wrap around. So we've got to do some kind of test for wrapping around. Now we know the list is 16 long, don't we? So we've got to add 16 items. So let's have a little loop for i in 0 to 25. 1 to 25. Add the thing to the queue. And what we better do is also read it back off the queue. Um, like this. And I think that is going to advance us until we wrap around. Uh, many Re writes and reads still work. That's just that's all it is, right? You just you can do this a lot. You write a value in there, you immediately read it out again. It should come out, and nothing should go wrong. And we, if my theory is right, that will fail. Yes, because we've gone past the length of the buffer. So that's because all we did was add one to start, but we didn't do the kind of thing that they did here, which is to make sure it wrapped around. So it should be more like this. Well, we're going to make sure that um, it's, it's modulo the length of data. So it's always within data. So we're going to make it one bigger. If it's gone off the end, it's going to become zero. Now that test should pass. OK, so good. Have we finished? What else could happen? Oh, well, we haven't got a test yet for what happens when you write too many values. So let's do that too. Many writes eventually fails. That's going to be something like that, right? So uh, should we do it with the exact number? So we should be able to put add 15 and it should be fine. So we're going to just say that will work. But then this won't work. Now we fail because we're full. And actually this, even if we do it, should be a 16 just for completeness. And even if we write another one, it should, now we keep failing. That test should also already pass because the, we didn't write the right method. And now let's just do one more, which is that after we've failed, we can succeed again, which I think is true. After we've failed, we can pass again if we read. I think that's true. 
fail because we're full. But now if we do a couple of reads, read a couple of Q dot read. Now we should be able to write 17 and 18, and those should both succeed. All right, these tests, too many of these tests are passing when I'm not clear that they're really running. Yep, oh, okay, it ran. Okay, so our test pass, um, we believe we've written a decent ring buffer. So we think we've done task number one. So task number two, the queue now has a fixed size, change the definition, so the data member becomes a box of U8. You can use the make box to make slices of arbitrary size. All right, so now let's have, instead of data being a fixed array, it's going to be a box of U8. And change the new method to take a size. So I guess the first thing to do would be to just say, let's just hard code the size. Let's make make box exist. And just check it still works. All right, so first thing is that data um, doesn't have a len method anymore. Whoops. Um, actually, there's a few things wrong. Let's start at the beginning. Um, hold it, hold it, hold it. So I think they may, oh no, I did it wrong, I did it wrong. Should be a box, a box pointing at an array of U8. Okay, does that make things better? Yeah, okay. So now it all works fine. All right, so that was it. Uh, so what we've done here is we've made the new method just make a fixed size thing, uh, just in a different way. Okay. So now change the new method to take a size like this. And that's the size of our buffer. And now whenever we create a buffer, we've got to specify the size. So there's going to be a couple of places where we do that. First of all, the main method. And I guess we can make this size 10 and that will still work. Let's try running it. Yep, one, two, three, four, five still works. And then here's a few places. So here, this can be any size, right? So let's say this one's three. This one's just got to be big enough to fit these things. So let's say 10. And then this one, we kind of explicitly expected there to be exactly 16 in that time. And this time also, well, actually, this is the one that we really explicitly expected it. This one could be, this one could be smaller. And this one also was expecting size 16. So actually, what we could do is, what would be nice would be to make this size 10 and adjust the test to fit. Um, let's see, let's adjust these numbers, otherwise that's really confusing. 11, 12, and 13 get written. So now we've got a test that checks that we do fail at 16 when we said 16, but also that we fail at... Hmm, this should be 9, shouldn't it? And this should be 10. So if we say make a ring buffer of size 10, we can actually only fit nine things in it. Um, and then when we write the 10th one, it does write, but it complains at us. Saying we can't write, I can't write any more than that, I guess is what it's saying. Yeah, okay. So it looks like all our tests still pass, which is confusing. Let's just make sure that we can break them by changing the size. Yeah, okay. Right, fine. Right, so that looks like that worked. So we've done the make new thing. In a queue that has size 10, how many elements can be stored at a time? Test your answer experimentally. So I think we have, right? You can store 
10 elements, but you get back an error saying you can't store any more. Okay. I'm pretty sure, I'm a little confused they're asking that. Like I think they're almost, almost it seems to me that um, they're saying that because my answer should be like, actually you can store nine. But it, I think you can store 10 because it doesn't fail, it actually writes it. But it says I can't, oh no, it writes it, but it doesn't move on the pointer. So yeah, it kind of wrote it and then ignored it. Which is a bit odd, isn't it? Let's try this out experimentally. That's what they told us to do. Let's do it in the main method, shall we? So let's try making our ring buffer be of size five. That means that we're going to fail to write the fifth one in. And then it probably, it should print out one, two, three, four, I think, if we're right. Yes, it does. So the fifth one didn't really get written in there. Um, but, and that's why it returned false. So it is weird. It wrote it in, it wrote the data in, but it didn't advance the end position. So even though it's written in there, it can't be, it's not visible. It's not, it's not kind of really there. So we could get rid of this and put it in here. And I think that should have the same effect. Yeah, so our test all still passed. So yeah, that was equivalent. Fine. All right, so that kind of confirmed our thing. So n minus one is the answer. All right, extra exercise. Add a method has room. So that has room is true if and only if writing the queue will succeed. Add a method peak. So that peak returns the same thing as read but leaves the element in the queue. All right, so let's do has room first. So we need a test for has room. And I guess we can say, um, we can, we can assert that we do have room everywhere in this loop. So I'm not, I'm not adding new tests for this. Maybe I should, um, but I think just in the interest of time, I reuse this test. So this test is going to fail now because there is no has room method. So let's add a has room method. Yeah, I mean, we really do need new tests because um, like we should have one for just the empty queued um, has room and stuff like that. But anyway, so basically if we, if start is not equal to end, then we have room. I think we'll see. We'll see what our tests pass. We failed because on line one five eight, we don't have room, and I thought we should have room. Um, and I guess we don't know how far around the loop we are, but have I done it wrong? I think maybe it should be. Yeah, so if... Oh no, yeah, I was completely wrong. I was reading the wrong code. We need to think about the code here, which is basically that if start is going to be... If we, get, if we try and write and it fails, then we don't have room. So it's going to be... If we add one to end and it, and, and yeah, it's going to be this. If we add one to end and wrap it around and that equals start, and that, that equals start. No, is that, not, if that equals start, then we haven't got room. And if, it doesn't equal start, then we have got room. So maybe that, 
Yeah, okay, that works. So you see why tests are so good? Because my brain doesn't... My brain never gets it right. But if you're right, the tests pretty much guarantee, almost, a lot closer to guaranteeing that you get it right in the end. Okay, so now we also want a peak method. It's the same thing as read, but leaves the element in the queue. So this is really simple. So we can just say... Um, I guess, let's just add a peek in here. Again, we should add new tests for this. Assert peak. Q dot peak. As, I guess it would still be an option. Um, and that's going to fail because peak doesn't exist. And let's just double check. Did they say it would... Returns the same thing as read, yeah. So peak is going to look like look at, peak is going to look a lot like read. But it's not going to advance start. It's just going to return what's already at start. There we go, that was peak implemented. So let's have a quick look at peak, because I went through that very quickly. So basically, if um, there's nothing in the list, peak returns none, otherwise it returns whatever is at the start of the list. So I guess the part we haven't sp spoken about much is why how we were able to change from a fixed size array to a box containing a slice. So first of all, how do we make that box containing a slice? Well, we've got this make box function. What that does is makes a vector and then calls into box slice, which basically um, uh, like because a vector owns its memory and a box of a slice also owns the memory. Sorry, not really a box slice, it's a boxed array. Anyway, no, I guess it's anyway, yeah, whatever, whatever you call it. Um, so the ownership still makes sense, right? Ve the vector owns the memory when it gets created, and then it get, passes on the memory to the box, and the box owns it from now on. So now there's a bit of, there's a chunk of memory um, pointed to by this box, which is going to get deleted when the box gets deleted. So we've got a box uh, here, and then it just so happens that whenever we do any of these operations, like self.data square bracket self.start, that is an operation that can be done on a vec. You can say, give me this element of the vec. But that operation can also be um, done on a slice. And because a box is kind of transparent to stuff like that, it, it like deref's to a slice. So when we do square bracket on a box, it actually does the square bracket on the slice underneath. So we didn't have to change any of this code that says square bracket blah or push. or No, no, no push. Uh, square bracket blah because uh, a box of a slice allows it just as much as a vec allows it. So that's why that whole thing works. Sorry if I skipped over that too quickly. That is it for the exercises for module A2. Um, hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you on the other side when we're going to move on to Module A3. See you next time.